Hi friends here the classic audio books represents early indians written by tony joseph part 2 the gates of asia so far we have been looking at the genetic and climatic sides of the over migration story when we come to archaeology however we see things in a slightly different light for reasons explained earlier genetics mostly focuses on people who left behind a lineage while archaeology looks at people who left behind archaeological evidence even if not a lineage this difference between the two disciplines could disappear soon though as archaeologists and geneticists get their hands on more and more ancient dna of humans who may or may not have living descendants In January 2018, for example, archaeologists announced that upper jaw teeth belonging to a modern human discovered in Mislia in North Israel had been dated to 180,000 years ago, making it the earliest human fossil found outside of Africa ever. The Mislia site was a rock shelter frequently used by archaic or extinct members of the Homo species for hundreds of thousands of years, something like an even older version of our own Bimbeka. Before the Mislia find, the earliest modern human fossils found outside of Africa were dated to between 80,000 and 120,000 years ago and these were also discovered in Israel from the nearby Skull and Kafsay caves. All these dates are much earlier than the estimated period of our migration between 50,000 and 60,000 years ago. And it is not just in the Levant, modern day Syria, Jordan, Lebanon and Israel that modern human fossils that old have turned up. In April 2018 a team of archaeologists announced they had discovered a modern human finger fossil in the Al Wasta prehistoric lake in northeastern Saudi Arabia dated to about 88,000 years ago. This area is a desert now, but it would have been a well-watered and inviting habitat 88,000 years ago with hundreds of freshwater lakes. We have found 10,000 ancient lakes in Arabia. We have visited about 200 and about 80% have evidence of archaeology said Michael Petraglia of the Max Planck Institute of Germany whose team made the discovery in an interview to National Geographic Based on current evidence it has becoming clear that modern humans started emerging in Africa around 300,000 years ago and they began their forays into the Levant by at least 180,000 years ago and into Arabia by at least 88,000 years ago But the question remains if modern humans were pushing through the gates of Asia as early as 180,000 to 88,000 years ago why were these initial forays not successful in terms of leaving behind a lineage that filled out our world why did they have to wait till around 60,000 years ago or so before that became possible especially when you consider that our evolutionary cousin homo erectus managed to move out of africa and spread as far as southeast asia as early as around 2 million years ago point 6 probably other members of the homo species also made their way out of africa much before homo sapiens did leaving behind descendant species such as neanderthals and denisovans so what stopped the first modern human explorers out of africa in their tracks there are two likely answers to that question One is, of course, climate cycles and the other, Neanderthals. The routes out of Africa into Asia probably closed or opened depending on whether the world was going through a cold, glacial period or a warm, interglacial period. The presence of Neanderthals is perhaps even more pertinent. The modern humans that moved into the Levant would almost certainly have come across the Neanderthals, the dominant species in Eurasia by then. There is plenty of archaeological evidence of their presence in the Levant around the same time as the modern humans were there. Neanderthal remains have been found at the Tabun cave in Israel, close to Skull, dated to 120,000 years ago, roughly the same period as when modern humans were there. They have also been found at the Kebera cave, not very far from the Skull Kafsay caves, and have been dated to 61,000 to 48,000 years ago. So it is quite possible that modern humans found it difficult to progress into Eurasia from the Levant because they couldn't prevail over the Neanderthals who were well adapted to the colder climate of Europe. Our ancestors ultimately did prevail over the Neanderthals tens of thousands of years later in Europe itself, but it should be noted that the first encounters between us perhaps didn't go in our favor. A proper understanding of what happened during the first attempts of the modern humans to break into Eurasia, however, is not possible without a grasp of both geography and climate. There were four possible paths for ancient modern humans out of Africa and into Eurasia, from Morocco in northwestern Africa to Spain across the Strait of Gibraltar. 
from Tunisia into Sicily, from Egypt into the Sinai Peninsula and on to the Levant, and from Eritrea in Eastern Africa to Yemen and Saudi Arabia across the Bab el Mandeb at the southern tip of the Red Sea. Of these four possibilities, there is no evidence that the first or the second routes were ever used. But we have plenty of evidence that the third and fourth routes were used whenever the climate allowed these routes to be opened. For much of what Pelea scientists call the Pleistocene between 2.58 million and 11,700 years ago, the climate would have been very cold and the Sahara and the Sinai would have been deserts, making the route to the Levant from Egypt a difficult one. But thankfully, there were interglacials, or warmer periods, these are the oddly numbered MIS stages, as we discussed earlier when the weather became wetter and the deserts became green and passable. During these periods, it would have been possible for both human and animal migrations to occur between Africa and Eurasia. The period between 243,000 and 191,000 years ago was an interglacial MIS-7, a relatively warm period, and so was the period from 130,000 to 71,000 years ago, MIS-5. The recent Mislia fossil, 180,000 years old, find comes broadly within the first period, while the Skulk of Se finds 80,000 to 120,000 years old in Israel fall within the second period. Whenever the warm interglacial periods ended and the climate cooled again, the Neanderthals already in central or northern Eurasia would perhaps have moved down to southern Eurasia in greater numbers in search of slightly warmer climes, putting pressure on the newly arrived Homo sapiens there. It is thus possible that the climate cycles and the presence of Neanderthals together are what scuppered the attempts of the first modern humans to colonize the rest of the world from Africa through the Levant. While we are using modern day geographical descriptions to explain what happened, our ancient ancestors wouldn't have been thinking in terms of moving from one continent to another at all. They would have been merely expanding or contracting the range of their movements, as climate patterns changed and along with it the regional spread of the flora and fauna on which they depended. Dry, cold periods would have shrunk their range and warm, wet periods would have invited them, along with the animals they were hunting to eat, to newer pastures. We do not know whether these early modern human occupants of the Levant managed to get back to Africa before the Sinai in the Sahara turned to dry deserts again or whether they just got cut off from Africa by these expanding deserts as the cold wave swept in, while also being hemmed in by the Neanderthals moving southward, and thus perished. What we do know is that after these first pieces of evidence of modern human presence in the Levant, we had to wait more than 30,000 years to see the next evidence of their presence in the region again, around 50,000 years ago, and this time, obviously, they survived. Breakthrough at the Gate of Tears while this was playing out on the Egypt to Levant route, usually called the Northern Route to Asia from Africa, there was action on the Southern Route too, which goes from Eritrea through Bab el Mandeb at the tip of the Red Sea, to Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Bab el Mandeb means Gate of Tears. One legend attributes it to the cries of the drowned as an earthquake blow apart Asia and Africa, while another legend says it is simply a warning to travelers of the dangers of trying to cross the sea as it was full of reefs. Unlike the northern route, which does not involve any crossing of the sea, the southern route involves the crossing of the Red Sea at Bab el Mandeb, a distance of about 30 kilometers currently. But during glacial periods, when the climate is cold and dry, the sea level recedes, thus reducing the distance across the Red Sea to a third, making the crossing somewhat easier. There is no archaeological proof that modern humans of this age had figured out how to build boats, but it is possible that they had, because there is evidence that they had been leading a beachcombing lifestyle for thousands of years, living off marine resources such as fish and shells. Boats would have been a nice and natural addition to that lifestyle. Whatever that may be, what we do know is that the cold and dry glacial periods that made life impossible for modern humans in the Levant may have been a little kinder on those making a move through the southern route. Not only because it made the Red Sea crossing easier, but also because once they crossed over to Arabia, the monsoons may have compensated somewhat for the dry aridity of the glacial ages at least in the coastal areas. The monsoons are a side effect of the existence of the Himalayas, which were formed as a consequence of the Indian tectonic plate pushing into the Eurasian plate beginning some 50 million years ago. So even during the coldest periods, some archaeologists posit, modern humans may have been able to cross into Asia at Bab el Mandeb. 
As we will shortly see, there is reason to be skeptical of the climatically deduced over migration window between 50,000 and 60,000 years ago. In fact, some archaeologists have been pushing for a much earlier migration out of Africa. Michael Petraglia is one of them. In 2012 he decided to back his convictions with an ambitious research project called Paleozerts which focused on Saudi Arabia and intended to uncover ancient connections between Africa and the rest of Eurasia. It was under this project that the 88,000-year-old finger fossil was discovered at the al Wusta prehistoric lake in northeastern Saudi Arabia. Talking about the discoveries that were being made, Petraglia said in an interview to Nature Asia, the most amazing thing to me are the fossil finds. They say something about the kinds of animals that could migrate into Arabia. We have fossils of elephants, these are gigantic creatures, much larger than the African elephant. Amazingly, we also have hippos. These finds tell you something of how wet it really was. Because the hippos cannot survive in very arid and dry situations, so the environment had to be green for them to survive. Was the person whose finger was found in al part of the successful migration that later went on to populate the rest of the world? Definitely not, because the dating of that fossil, at 88,000 years ago, puts it beyond the maximum range for over migration that geneticists have deemed possible. So it is likely that this early migrant was part of a group that perished, much like those in the Levant. Or to propose a more radical idea, perhaps a subsection of his group managed to escape the aridity of interior Arabia as the climate changed, made it to South Asia, and perhaps even managed to make it to Southeast Asia and Australia over thousands of years, but all of them perished for a combination of reasons or perhaps mostly because of the Toba supervolcanic eruption, the most violent volcanic eruption in the past two million years, thus leaving behind no genetic trace in today's populations. What Petraglia's findings in the Arabian desert prove is that the southern route was very much viable, and that it is almost certainly the route taken by those modern humans who went on to fill up the world at the time of the Oro migration. The Arabian chapter in the history of the first modern human migration is momentous for quite a different reason too. This is the most likely place where modern humans and Neanderthals first met, mated and left behind a genetic trail in all non-African modern human genomes that is still detectable today. All non-Africans carry about 2% of Neanderthal genome. There is no reason why this interbreeding couldn't have happened in different regions repeatedly. But it is simple to assume that at least one mixing happened near where the first migrants broke out of Africa and before they split to go their different ways because that is the easiest explanation as to how all non-Africans came to possess a similar amount of Neanderthal DNA. When this discovery of Neanderthal genes in humans was first announced in 2010, the world was shocked because until then we had considered Neanderthals quite inferior to us and as belonging to a different species that would not have been able to reproduce with us. Now, of course, we know that we interbred not just with Neanderthals but with Denisovans as well, and that this may not be the full story either. In Africa and elsewhere too, research is throwing up the increasing likelihood that there were more interbreeding events between modern humans and our genetic cousins, some of whom we may not even have identified yet. Now that we have taken the story out of Africa and into Asia, this may be a good time to bring in evidence from another part of the world that allows us to get a clearer picture of when the OA episode took place and what might have happened after it. That part of the world is Australia, and it is a crucial element of any story about the first migrants. In June 2018 a team of scientists led by the archaeologist Chris Clarkson of the University of Queensland, Australia, established that humans were in that continent by between 59,300 and 70,700 years ago, or if you take the midpoint, by 65,000 years ago. The scientists did by this by careful dating of things left behind by modern humans in a cave in Majed Beeb in Australia's Northern Territory, things such as mortars, pestles, ground edge axes and painting material. Since Australia has never been populated by any member of the Homo species other than Homo sapiens, there is little doubt that this was the work of our own species. In July 2018 another study led by Kira Westway of Macquarie University, in Sydney, declared that two teeth discovered from the leader Ajayar cave in Indonesia's Sumatra Island a century ago had been securely dated to between 63,000 and 73,000 years ago, and that they belonged to modern humans. Together, 
These two studies have pushed back the date for modern human occupation of Southeast Asia and Australia by 15,000 to 20,000 years and put severe constraints on both the timing of the Oer episode and the mode of migration. Even if you take the lowest estimate of these two studies, it is clear that modern humans were in Southeast Asia by at least 63,000 years ago. That means the Oer episode has to be outside the postulated range of 50,000 to 60,000 years ago. There are only two ways to square the circle. 1. Either the people who left behind fossils and tools at Majed Beeb and Lida Rajair were part of an earlier wave of migrants from Africa who failed to leave behind a genetic lineage, or the Oer episode happened much earlier than previously believed, even if this means modern humans crossed over to Arabia during a cold and dry glacial period rather than a wetter, warmer interglacial period. This would push the date for Oer closer to the absolute limit of genetic possibility for Oer at 80,000 years ago. Let us consider this option and see where it goes. The race through Asia what is a reasonable amount of time for hunter-gatherers to walk down from, say, Yemen to Australia, taking into account that they would not be walking with the intention to reach Australia, but merely to hunt, gather, eat and survive. There is no easy way of telling, but we do know from archaeological evidence that it took the first migrants to America about 16,000 years ago only a couple of thousand years to reach the tip of South America from Alaska a distance of about 21,000 kilometers. They probably moved down the coastal route on the western seaboard of the Americas. The beauty of a coastal route is that it makes the migration process faster and simpler in two ways. One, the migrating hunter-gatherers do not have to keep upgrading or changing their life skills dramatically, so their progress can be quick. Two, a coastal route gives an unintentional direction to their migration, taking them forward inexorably, unlike an inland route with its surprises, roundabouts and uncertainties. Now to come back to our topic. The distance from, say, Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula to Australia, if you take the coastal route, is not much more than the distance from Alaska to the southern tip of Argentina. So even if you assume it would take double the time, it is perhaps possible to cover the distance in about 4000 to 5000 years, assuming, of course, that migrants mostly take the coastal route as the first migrants to the Americas did. Now if you start with the middle point of 65,000 years ago for the Australian evidence of modern humans, then the Walkathon from Africa should have begun about 70,000 years ago, which is still within the ballpark of the genetic estimates, though it would mean a crossing at the Red Sea into the Arabian Peninsula during the glacial period. 8. What does genetics say about all this? Is it in line with the idea of a rapid dispersal of beachcombing modern humans out of Africa using the southern route and reaching Australia from Yemen in about 5,000 years or so? The answer is an emphatic yes. Genetic evidence is not just compatible with such a quick expansion, it actually demands such a rapid spread. The reason is that if the spread was slow with many rests in between, the genetic tree would look nested, and that is not the case. To take a theoretical example, if haplogroup M spread to India and settled there for a few thousand years, then a few subhaplogroups of M would have emerged because of mutations, and therefore the next migration out of India to, say, Myanmar would have included those subhaplogroups. If those subhaplogroups then spent a few thousand years in Myanmar before moving on to, say, Thailand, we would have seen many more new subhaplogroups emerging and taking part in the migration to the next destination. Thus, successive regions would have received successive subhaplogroups. If you drew the phylogenetic tree of such an expansion, it would look like one subhaplogroup nested under another, and then under another and so on, as we move from one region to another. But what we see in reality is nothing like that. M spread all the way to Australia, before too many mutations could arise. And each region has its own direct subhaplogrips of M in short, genetics strongly supports a rapid expansion to Australia after the African exodus. If such a rapid migration peopled Asia roughly between 70,000 and 60,000 years ago, there aren't enough modern human fossils from this period in South Asia to confirm it. The fossils that we do have from the region are of a much younger age. The earliest modern human fossil in South Asia was found in Sri Lanka, at the Fahim Caves in the Kalutura district, dated to about 35,000 years ago. More modern human fossil finds from the Batadombalena Caves, also in Sri Lanka, are dated to about 28,000 years ago. 
these discoveries proved beyond doubt that the migrants from Africa would have been quite at home in coastal India and even in the tropical island of Sri Lanka. Fossils in both these places were found along with microlithic or tiny stone tools that might have been used to give sharp tips to arrows and spears. Such microlithic tools are typically associated with modern humans as opposed to archaic or extinct members of the Homo species. But if the first modern humans traveled down the western coast of India, and then up the eastern coast, before moving to Southeast Asia and then to China and Japan as well as Australia, why have there been no fossil or shell midden or even stone tool findings along the Indian coast? One reason could be that the period between 71,000 and 57,000 years ago was a glacial period MIS-4 and sea levels would have been lower than they are today. So the first migrants would have been moving through regions that are all below the sea today, thus reducing our chances of finding proof along the coast. Proof would become available only when people moved inland, such as in Fahin, and that might have taken time and, therefore, the earliest evidence of modern human presence in South Asia is likely to be of a much younger age than the date of the first migration itself. Not all archaeologists or geneticists buy into the coastal migration route. Though, Ravi Korisetter of Karnatik University and the geneticist Stephen Oppenheimer and the archaeologist Michael Haslam of the University of Oxford recently argued in a paper 9 that the slope of the coast would determine how much of the continental shelf became visible when the sea level retreated. A continental shelf with a very low slope would reveal a lot of new land, perhaps tens of kilometers wide, while a continental shelf with a steep slope would reveal little new land. According to these scientists, the Indian continental shelf, especially on the western coast, mostly has a steep slope, and so it is unlikely that the first Indians were walking along lands that later went under the sea. The reason why we have not found evidence of the coastal migration route, they say, is that modern humans were opportunistic in the routes they took, sometimes taking the coastal route and sometimes the inland routes. These are arguments that will be settled only when we find older modern human fossils. Now that we have dated the first modern human settlers in India to sometime around 65,000 years ago, because they had to have left Africa about 70,000 years ago based on Australian and Southeast Asian fossil finds as we discussed earlier, let us tackle some outstanding questions about how the rest of the world was populated before moving ahead with our story. We have so far talked about Oa migrants moving through the Arabian Peninsula into South Asia and then going on to populate East Asia and Australia. But what about Europe and Central Asia? When did those regions get populated? The earliest evidence for modern human occupation of Europe dates to about 45,000 years ago, the irony of this shouldn't be missed, when the first migrants, or the Aborigines, reached Australia around 65,000 years ago, the Europeans did not exist. This delay in populating Europe, a gap of about 25,000 years between the Oer episode and the first evidence of modern humans in Europe, suggests that the route from the Arabian Peninsula to Europe was not open until the climate warmed up quite a bit. There would have been two major obstacles on the route from the Arabian Peninsula into Europe during the glacial period. 1. The Rub, Al Khali or Empty Quarter, the largest contiguous sand desert in the world which occupies the southern third of the Arabian Peninsula, and 2. The Zagros and Taurus Mountains of Iran, which would have been an equally formidable barrier. So the place that the first migrants went to occupy after South Asia was probably not Europe, but Central Asia, conclude Cory Setter and the other scientists in the paper mentioned above. They possibly walked from where Pakistan is today, up the Indus banks and into Central Asia. And then, after the climate got warmer around 57,000 years ago, some of the people from the Oa migration still living in the Arabian Peninsula or somewhere close to South Asia could have moved west across the Zagros Mountains into Turkey, Syria, Israel and Europe. That might have been followed later by a second migration from Central Asia to Europe around 30,000 years ago. Around the same time as some of the Central Asian groups were moving into Europe, others might have migrated to the regions around Beringia, which would function as a land bridge between Alaska and Siberia during extreme cold climate, and which would have served as the staging ground for the first migrants into the Americas around 16,000 years ago. Before this migration to the Americas from Asia, some of the early occupants of East Asia had moved into Siberia and the regions around it like Beringia and mixed with the people there. 
Thus, the migrants moving into the Americas would have had an East Asian genetic heritage as well, not just a Central Asian one. So that completes a very skeletal history of Oer and the subsequent migrations that filled up the world. The southern petal of Jambudvipa the cosmology of most cultures portrays the place they inhabit as the center of the universe. Our own cosmology, common to Buddhism, Hinduism and Jainism, is similar but only in some ways. This cosmology was probably brought in or created by one of the later migrants into South Asia, but let us keep that aside for the moment. In the telling of that cosmology, it is our world, called Jambudvipa, that lies at the center of seven concentric circles of alternating land and sea. The sea is made up, successively from inward to outward, of salt water, sugarcane juice, wine, ghee, curd, milk and water. And at the raised center of Jambudvipa rises Meru, the mountain, the abode of the gods. In some visualizations, Jambudvipa is divided into four vast regions, each one shaped like the four petals of a lotus, with Meru at the center, like a pericarp, the southern petal being Bharatvarsha. When the first group of modern humans walked into India, perhaps no more than a few hundred people in groups of 20 or 25, trekking all the way from the Arabian Peninsula over hundreds of years or perhaps even a thousand or more years, did they have a cosmology of their own that tried to explain the inexplicable? And did they have any inkling that they were entering a special place that more than a billion of their descendants would one day call their home? We are unlikely to ever know the answers to such questions, but there are other questions that we can crack with the technology and material evidence that we have. Questions such as, when they entered India, were they walking into a country that they had all to themselves, like the first modern humans in Australia or the Americas, or did they have competition in the form of other members of the Homo species, like in the Levant and Arabia? Did they tangle with each other? Or did they tangle? Did our ancestors drive the others to extinction? Did they bring advanced technology, like bows and arrows and spears, or did they come with just a middle paleolithic stone toolkit of scrapers, axes and sharp flakes that could be used as blades? And, of course, what did they look like? Do we have their direct descendants among us today? How big a brood have they left behind? Where can we find them? Let us start with the most tangible question first. What did they look like? We know that the Onj and the Andaman Islands are descendants of the original Oa migrants who may have mixed less with other groups. But does that mean the first Indians looked like them? That would be stretching things too far. Today's Onj are as distant chronologically from the first migrants as any of us. This is such an obvious truth that it shouldn't be necessary to say it. But it is surprising how often our mind plays tricks with us. For example, when we think of the earliest modern humans, say, those who existed 300,000 years ago, our mental picture of them may resemble today's Africans. But this is an ill-conceived idea. The Africans of today are exactly as removed from the earliest modern humans as we are, and have gone through similar levels of mutation and change as the rest of humanity. They are no closer to the early modern humans than we are. Mutations can change the color of the skin, the shape of the nose, the texture of the hair, or the slant of the eye, not to speak of such things as the ability to survive at high altitudes Tibetans or to stay underwater for long the Bajau people of Southeast Asia. Similarly, in the case of the Onj 60,000 or 65,000 years is a long time for mutations to have done their work, and also for drift and selection pressures to have winnowed the genetic field. What is drift and selection? Genetic drift is the phrase geneticists use to describe the tendency of small sequestered populations to have declining genetic diversity over time. The principle is simple. In every generation, there is a chance that the last person carrying a particular genetic variation may die without leaving an heir. In a large population, the chances of any single genetic variation dwindling down to having just one last representative is low and, therefore, the effect of drift will be less too. In other words, small populations are likely to lose enough diversity over time and become more homogeneous or rather drift towards a uniform genetic standard. So in a given time, drift alone could make a small population look very different from how they used to look. The word selection, on the other hand, alludes to the essential process of evolution, the physical environment or the social environment or sexual preferences lending greater genetic success to some traits or mutations and less success to others, thus shaping the evolution of a population in a particular way. 
So it is highly likely that because of all these mutations, drift and selection, the Ange today look quite different from what the first Indians looked like. This is precisely the process, mutation, drift and selection, that makes different population groups separated by distance or other geographical barriers grow genetically distinct over time. Until we find a well-preserved skeleton from some 65,000 years ago that we can use to reconstruct the faces of the first migrants, we have only one other, suboptimal, option, look for ancient skeletons of modern humans from other regions. And we do have one from the Skull Cave of Israel, although it is dated much earlier, between 80,000 and 120,000 years ago. It is the skeleton of a female modern human, and the reconstructed face shows a person we can easily identify with, but with some distinct differences. Search for an image of mitochondrial Eve on the net. Of course, we have no idea what level of difference existed among modern humans in different parts of Africa and the Levant over 80,000 years ago. It is possible that the people who moved into the Arabian Peninsula, who would eventually reach South Asia, looked quite different from those who broke into the Levant. But this is the best we can do as of now. An equally important question, which has implications for the way modern humans settled in different parts of the subcontinent, is this, when they walked into India, did they run smack into archaic members of the homo species already settled here? Without doubt, yes. This does not mean we have lots of fossil evidence to prove the existence of archaic or extinct members of the homo species in the subcontinent when the modern humans arrive. We have almost none. The only archaic human fossil evidence we have is a cranium discovered at Hathnora on the Narmada riverbank dated to around 250,000 years ago, which we will discuss in chapter 2. What we do have, instead, are lots and lots of stone tools belonging to different styles and ages, from the lower Paleolithic to the middle Paleolithic and Microlithic, making it clear that India was by no means an inviting, empty land when our ancestors arrived. Paleolithic just means old stones, and Microlithic means tiny stones. Lower Paleolithic covers the oldest style stone tools created by modern and archaic humans, essentially choppers, cleavers and axes, all of them big and heavy and made by chipping away at large stones, often in a style called Acheulean. In Middle Paleolithic, the style of the tools changes, with humans learning how to prepare a core from a big stone in such a way that many, many different flakes can be struck off to make scrapers and points and so on, thus reducing the time and effort needed to make tools and also improving their quality. Middle Paleolithic tools are smaller in comparison to Lower Paleolithic tools, and Microlithic tools are smaller still, with some measuring less than a centimeter. These were often blades or points or variations of them and were often attached to bones or sticks and used as knives or arrows or spear tips. Microlithic tools are closely associated with modern humans, but not so the Paleolithic or Middle Paleolithic tools. Any modern or archaic human could have made them and so just by looking at these tools we cannot say with certainty which member of the Homo species was responsible for them. In other words, through much of their history, modern humans and archaic humans made much the same kinds of tools, though there could have been some regional variations. Broadly, the categorization of tools as lower and middle Paleolithic or Microlithic refers to their type, not their age. The earliest evidence of Paleolithic tools in India is from at Tirampikkam in Tamil Nadu, 69 kilometers from Chennai, and dated to around 1.5 million years ago, that is, 1.2 million years before modern humans emerged. The Hunsvi Bichbal Valley in northern Karnataka around 1.2 million years ago, the Middle Sun Valley in Madhya Pradesh, the Sivalik Hills in the outer Himalaya, the subcontinent is littered with evidence of the widespread presence of archaic humans much before modern humans set foot in the region and even evolved. Did all of them belong to the same species as the Narmada discovery, perhaps Homo heidelbergensis or Homo erectus? Or were there Neanderthals as well? Or another archaic human, as yet undiscovered? That is not entirely unlikely. We may not have yet identified all the varieties of archaic humans, not even those that were contemporaneous with our own ancestors when they were spreading around the world. The Denisovans, for example, were discovered only about a decade ago when an ancient juvenile finger bone and a few teeth were retrieved from the Denisova caves in the Altai mountains of southern Siberia and the finger bone was later DNA sequenced. The DNA analysis made it clear, to everyone's surprise, that this was a species quite different from both modern humans and Neanderthals. 
the fossil assemblage was dated to between 50,000 and 30,000 years ago. Until this discovery, there was never any suggestion that such a species existed. In fact, the Denisovans are yet to be given a proper species name. So, in short, we know South Asia had abundant presence of archaic humans but we do not know precisely who they were. We know, though, that they were smart enough to be among the first in the world to upgrade their tool technology from the traditional to the state of the art. At Atirampikkam, we have evidence that they moved up from making lower Paleolithic tools to middle Paleolithic tools around 385,000 years ago. This came to light only because of the outstanding and long-term work of the archaeologist Shanti Papu and her team at Atirampikkam, and their findings about the emergence of middle Paleolithic tools in this region around 385,000 years ago were published as late as in January 2018. The transition from lower to middle Paleolithic tool making was a huge conceptual jump. This is because to start making middle Paleolithic style tools, you need to think many, many steps ahead, keeping in mind the final shape of the tool you want, and then shaping the core in such a manner that you can knock off precisely the kind of sharp tools you want, with very few strokes. If a middle Paleolithic tool maker wanted to put down an Acheulean style tool maker, he could honestly say, any idiot can do that. Any idiot doesn't include us, of course, because stone napping is a specialized skill today, and we would need a lot of practice to become an expert napper. Up against our cousins we know from the history of early human expansion into the Levant that modern humans found it difficult to break into regions where archaic humans were already dominant. So it is reasonable to assume that when our ancestors arrived at the threshold of India, they too found themselves stymied as in the Levant. In the paper mentioned earlier, Cory Setter, Oppenheimer and Haslam suggest a new model for how modern humans may have responded to the situation, terming it the Indian stage dispersal. In broad brush terms this means our ancestors arrived at different parts of the subcontinent at different times, and did not expand all over it in one fell sweep. They are all from the same, single over migration, but they may have reached different regions of India at different times, just as they reached different parts of the world at different times. The opening assumption of the scientists is that archaic humans would have been present in far more intimidating numbers in peninsular India than in northern India. A valid observation, as evidenced by the archaeological discoveries in Atirampikkam, Munsgi Bichbal Valley, Middle Sun Valley, Bhimbetka, etc. All south of the Vindhyas. So the incoming modern humans would have taken a sub-Himalayan route across the subcontinent, the scientists posit avoiding the peninsular region, and going on to Myanmar and then Southeast Asia and further on to Australia, East Asia and China. There is, of course, no reason why all the first Indians need have taken only the sub-Himalayan route. Some of them could have taken a coastal route that would have kept them out of the way of the troublesome archaic humans who were present in the central and interior parts of the peninsula. We know today that that was what happened when the first migrants arrived in the Americas, they took different routes and got separated for thousands of years. Either way, the first Indians may have managed to avoid a direct and immediate conflict with the existing robust populations of archaic humans. When we talk about migrants having taken this or that route or having gone here or there, it is not to suggest they would have en masse vacated the areas they were occupying to go and settle in new regions. It means that they and their descendants kept expanding their range into newer and newer areas, without necessarily vacating the places they were already in. Over time, the modern humans would have expanded their footprint in the subcontinent, even moving south and displacing the archaic humans and probably driving them to extinction. The sudden appearance of microlithic tools in the Indian archaeological record may be a clue to when and how this may have happened. Even though stone tools don't necessarily help us identify different species of humans most of the time, microliths are a kind of exception. In India and elsewhere, they have been linked more closely with modern humans than archaic humans, and in the subcontinent we see microliths making their appearance around 45,000 years ago. Thereafter, they show a surprising level of continuity and expansion, and not just in the subcontinent. We see a similar emergence of microliths in Sri Lanka around 38,000 years ago, and they persist from then on till approximately 3,000 years ago, near about when iron makes its presence felt, both in India and in Sri Lanka. The earliest microliths in South Asia were found at Mehtakheri in Madhya Pradesh, dated to 45,000 years ago. 
Mehtakheri is one of eight sites in the Nimar region of Madhya Pradesh that had microliths ranging in age from 45,000 years to 3,400 years. Curiously, the timing and location of the early finds of microliths tally quite nicely with the timing and location of an expansion increase in population of some first Indian lineages. According to the 2017 paper on the genetic chronology of the Indian subcontinent mentioned earlier, there was a major expansion and dispersal of mtDNA haplogroup M in central and eastern India between 45,000 and 35,000 years ago. Point one one towards the end of this period is also when the climate slowly began to deteriorate as the world got closer to the full glacial conditions of MIS-2. So there are many things happening together, the climate slowly starts getting more dry and arid, putting stress on all living populations, modern humans start relying more and more on microlithic tools, and their population then starts expanding and spreading to new areas. The region where all of this takes place, central India, also happens to be one of the most favored areas for archaic humans to inhabit. Could it be that as modern humans in India found their habitats becoming drier and more arid, they responded by depending more and more on a new technology that involved making microliths and using them to create weapons like spears and arrows in order to hunt better and beat rival claimants to food and other resources? And could they have then moved into new areas that were still habitable but that they had hitherto avoided because of the presence of archaic humans there? If that is what they had indeed done, it could be said that they succeeded in all their missions, which resulted in a rapid rise in their population. A 2009 study, Population Increase and Environmental Deterioration Correspond with Microlithic Innovations in South Asia CA. 35,000 years ago, 12 authored by some of the biggest names in archaeology and genetics, says, it has been estimated that between about 45,000 and 20,000 years ago, most of humanity lived in South Asia. This evidence is thought to reflect a population expansion in the subcontinent that is unparalleled elsewhere. Like the archaic humans in Atirampikkam who were at the cutting edge of technology around 385,000 years ago when they moved up to making middle paleolithic tools, the modern humans of central India can lay claim to having been at the forefront of technology once again around 45,000 years ago, as they started making and using microlithic tools and weapons. However, while the earliest microliths at Mehtakheri are dated to about 45,000 years ago, the technology would have arrived in different regions on the subcontinent at different periods of time. In fact, it arrives only around 35,000 years ago at critical places such as Patne in Maharashtra, Jwalapuram in Andhra Pradesh and Fahin and Batadombalena in Sri Lanka. So here is a scenario that we can put together, based on what we know. Around 65,000 years ago, modern humans arrive in India and are blindsided by the presence of archaic humans who have been well settled in the region for hundreds of thousands of years. They then move in a gradual and opportunistic manner, some going across sub-Himalayan northern India from the west to the east, and some taking the coastal route from the north to the south. By the time the climate reached crisis point around 35,000 years ago, modern humans had already equipped themselves with better technology to hunt down their prey and beat back their rivals. As success built on success, the rapidly growing population of modern humans started expanding their range and moving deeper into the peninsular region, thus probably forcing archaic humans to restrict themselves to local refuges such as Jwalapuram or perhaps Bhimbetka until they went extinct. Jwalapuram is a good place to understand how this might have worked. Located in the Jariu River Valley of Karnul district, its significance lies in the fact that the river basin holds layers of ash left behind by the Toba supervolcanic eruption of 74,000 years ago. When the volcano erupted in the Sumatran island, millions of tons of ash was dumped all over Southeast Asia and South Asia, causing stress to all life in the region. The Jwalapuram site was discovered by Professor Cory Setter and was excavated a decade ago by a team of archaeologists led by him and Professor Petraglia. They found something remarkable at the bottommost layer, under the ash, middle paleolithic tools dated to around 77,000 years ago, made by who they thought were modern humans. They also found a continuation of the same tool technology above the ash layer, but dated to 45,000 to 35,000 years ago. Those findings created a stir because these frontally challenged the version that said over happened only around 70,000 years ago. 
Petraglia holds onto the theory that these tools were made by modern humans but the paper co-authored by Cory Setter, Oppenheimer and Haslam in 2017 says that these products are most likely the product of archaic hominins. More interestingly, Cory Setter and Petraglia also found microliths appearing in the same Jeryu Valley, starting from around 38,000 years ago and persisting until a few thousand years ago. Regarding these microliths, Cory Setter, Oppenheimer and Haslam say, we see the most parsimonious explanation for the Jeryu material record to be the movement of modern humans into the area 40,000 to 35,000 years ago. If this interpretation is correct, that the Jeryu Valley was a settlement of archaic humans where Homo sapiens came around 35,000 to 40,000 years ago, then the valley could have been one of the most prominent sites in the conflict between modern humans armed with the new technology of microliths and their archaic cousins still working with middle paleolithic tools. Whether it was also one of the last, we will probably never know. As you approach the wide open terrain of Jawalapuram you can see people carting away the Toba volcanic ash in sacks to be sold as detergent or brass polish. When I visited the site in early 2018, there were trenches dug by miners, and a few meters down their walls wide bands of white ash, the remains of the mega eruption, could be clearly seen. When the volcano erupted, only about 5 centimeters of ash had fallen on the valley, but the band you see today is inches, not just centimeters, thick. This is because apart from the primary ash fall, the valley, for a long time afterwards, had been receiving more ash carried into it by monsoon rains, streams and the Jeryu River. As you stand on the riverbed, it is tantalizing to try to visualize the drama that might have unfolded about 38,000 years ago on this ground, as the first modern humans of India moved into what could have been one of the last remaining refuges of archaic humans. How long did it take for the modern humans to complete the occupation of India and when did the last archaic humans on this land pass into history? Those are secrets that science is yet to unravel, but by looking at how far they were able to reach into South Asia all the way across to southwest Sri Lanka by about 38,000 years ago and to what extent they were able to move into the long-standing preserves of our archaic cousins Jawalapuram by about 35,000 years ago, we can fairly assume that by around that time our ancestors were truly masters of the land they came into some 30,000 years earlier. For a glimpse of the first Indians, look in the mirror. This leads us to the next questions, where are their descendants today? How many are there, and where can we find them? If you want to find their closest direct descendants living today, who haven't mixed with other populations all that much, you need to go to the little Andaman island and look up the Ange. There are only about a hundred of them left now, down from about 670 in 1900. Their maternal haplogroup is M and paternal haplogroup is D. They made it to the news in 2011 when a new baby was born, taking the strength of the tribe to 101. But really, if you want to see the lineage of the first Indians, you probably only need to look into the mirror or look around in your office or home. Unlike many other regions, such as Europe, Australia or the Americas, which have seen the lineage of their original inhabitants dwindle to very low levels, the genetic lineage of the first Indians forms the foundation, the bedrock, of the Indian population today. In fact, between half and two-thirds of our genome-wide ancestry today comes from the first Indians. This genome-wide figure, which applies to both men and women, is the most appropriate measure to grasp the genetic makeup of Indians, but there are other ways to look at it too, which provide other kinds of insights. For example, if you look at mtDNA lineages you will find that somewhere between 70 and 90% of people are descendants of the first Indians, with M lineages being the most popular. If you look at Y chromosome lineages, though, the picture is different, first Indian descendants account for only 10 to 40% of the haplogrips, depending on which population group you are considering. This massive difference between the male and female lines of descent encapsulates the history of later migrations, which we will tackle in Chapter 4. At this point you could refer back to PP. 19 to 26 that dealt with mtDNA and Y chromosome lineages, or here is a brief summary. mtDNA is transferred from mother to daughter in an unbroken chain, while Y chromosome is transferred from father to son similarly. 
So when we say that somewhere between 70 and 90 percent of mtDNA lineages derive their origin from the first Indians, it means that in the case of 70 to 90 percent of Indian women, if you trace their maternal line back through the ages, you will arrive at a woman who was an original Oa migrant and reached India some 65,000 years ago. Similarly, when we say that 10 to 40 percent of Y chromosome lineages are of first Indian descent, it means that in the case of 10 to 40 percent of all Indian men, if you trace their paternal line back through the ages, you will arrive at a man who was an original Oa migrant. So here is a question, if you were to identify a single person who embodies us Indians the best, who do you think it should be? Ideally, it should be a tribal woman because she is most likely to be carrying the deepest rooted and widest spread mtDNA lineage in India today, M2. In a genetic sense, she would represent all of our history, with very little left out. She shares the most with the largest number of Indians, no matter where in the social ladder they stand, what language they speak and which region they inhabit because we are all migrants, and we are all mixed. And she was here from the beginning. And she was most likely also at Mohenjo Daro as the dancing girl, the image on the cover about 4,500 years ago, during the period that most shaped us as we are today. But before we get to the urban civilization of Mohenjo Daro, Harappa, Dolivera, Rakhigadi, and the other cities and towns in the valleys of the Indus and Ghagbar Hakra Twin River systems, we need to know how we became farmers from hunter gatherers, over what period of time and why. To the first farmers how the first Indians and Zagrosian herders from Iran planted the first seeds of an agricultural revolution that spread like wildfire across India's northwestern region creating the necessary conditions for the birth of the world's largest early civilization. One way to understand the population structure of today's India is to think of it as a pizza, with the first Indians forming its base. Some parts of the pizza are thin crust, some parts thick crust, but all parts need to have the base, the pizza doesn't exist without it. Then comes the sauce that is spread all over the pizza. And then the cheese and the toppings, the people who came into the subcontinent later, at various periods. The cheese and the toppings are not uniform across the different slices. Some slices have an extra topping of tomato, some have more of capsicum and others a lot of mushroom. The sauce, the cheese or the toppings that you find on this Indian pizza are not unique, these are found in other parts of the world too, some in West Asia, some in Southeast Asia and some in Europe and Central Asia. But the base of the pizza is unique to India, you will not find another one like it anywhere else in the world. And neither will you find a pizza with this level of diversity in any place other than Africa. What accounts for this level of diversity, this distinction, of India? In a sense, this is the story of this book. A large part of the genetic diversity is due to South Asia perhaps being second only to Africa in having been occupied for the longest time by a large population of modern humans. This itself generates diversity because with each generation and each replication of an individual's genome, mutations can occur and over time these differences accumulate. And the larger the population, the larger the number of new mutations. As we saw in the last chapter, India has had one of the largest modern human populations in the world for tens of thousands of years. But that is only part of the reason for the diversity. The other major reason is migrations. So let us try to understand how we ended up where we are today from the ground up. This chapter will look at the first major migration that reshaped India's demography after the first Indians reached the subcontinent some 65,000 years ago. Masters of all they see when we left the previous chapter, the first Indians had finally become masters of the land they had migrated to, having driven the archaic humans to extinction. Or at least having outlasted them. When exactly did the archaic humans in India go extinct? We have no real, fact-based understanding of this. In fact, we do not even know for sure what species they belong to, Homo erectus, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo neanderthalensis or a species that is yet to be identified. There has only been one discovery of an archaic human fossil in South Asia, a partially complete cranium dated to around 250,000 years ago, recovered from Hathnora in Madhya Pradesh's Narmada Valley in 1982. It was first classified as a Homo erectus, then as an archaic version of Homo sapiens itself, then as Homo heidelbergensis and as of now the debate is still unsettled. 
It is not surprising then that we do not know when these archaic humans went extinct in the subcontinent either. We do know, though, that Neanderthals went extinct in Europe around 40,000 years ago, with the Iberian Peninsula in southwestern Europe being their last stand and refuge. Modern humans reached Europe around 45,000 years ago, so they had a few thousand years of coexistence with Neanderthals. The nature of modern human interaction with Neanderthals in Europe is a matter of debate, but it is safe to say that soon after modern humans reached the continent, Neanderthals had to retreat from everywhere because of conflict with the new arrivals or because of new diseases spread by them or because of a number of other factors. In India the extinction of the archaic homo species may have happened around 35,000 years ago, as we saw in chapter 1, and homo sapiens would have then become for the first time master of all they surveyed. So modern humans in India have had a very long time to spread themselves out and make their presence felt all over the habitable regions of the subcontinent in the north, east, south and west. This explains why the Indian pizza has a base that is present throughout South Asia. But why is this base unique? It is unique because the ancestry of the first Indians forms the base of 50 to 65 percent of the ancestry of Indian population groups. And this first Indian ancestry has no close relatives outside the subcontinent today. Its closest relatives once left India to migrate to Southeast Asia and then the rest of East Asia and Australia, but that separation happened around 65,000 years ago and it would be a stretch to call any of them close relatives anymore. Deep time makes separated populations evolve differently along different paths. That is why the base of the Indian pizza is both unique and omnipresent in the region, almost all regions, all linguistic groups and all castes and tribes of the country carry the genetic imprint of the first Indians, as scientific studies have shown repeatedly. This is also why it is accurate to describe them as the foundation or the base of the Indian population. Why then is the base thin in some regions, such as the northwest, and thick in some other regions, such as the south? This can be put down to subsequent migrations into India from the outside which, to varying degrees, replaced, displaced or subsumed the first Indians. Broadly, areas such as the northwest or the northeast, the regions through which newer migrants arrive, have a thinner base of first Indians than central or peninsular India. Who are these later migrants and when did they arrive? To answer this, we need to turn to paleoclimate, or the climate during ancient times. As we saw earlier, the earliest evidence for microliths in the subcontinent dates to about 45,000 years ago, and by 35,000 years ago or so they had become widespread. The climate had already started deteriorating as the world began its descent towards a long glacial period that would last from around 29,000 years ago to 14,000 years ago. But the ending of the glacial age wasn't quite neat and dramatic. The gradual warming that began near the end of the glacial age was interrupted by another cold twitch that lasted about 1300 years, between 12,900 and 11,700 years ago, when the world climate turned dry and arid once more, during the phase called Younger Dryers. It is only when the Younger Dryers too ended that the world really entered a long-lasting warm, wetter and greener period called Holocene 11,700 years ago. We are still in the Holocene. It is often during periods of climatic upheaval such as these that we see new dramatic developments taking place in human history, proving once again that our species needs either fear, lack of resources or greed promise of plenty to propel it forward. For example, around 16,000 years ago when the glacial period was slowly coming to an end, the Americas were being occupied for the first time by Asians coming in through Beringia, the land bridge that connected the two continents where modern-day Russia and Alaska are. Thus in the early Holocene we see on-off experiments in the Fertile Crescent in West Asia, today's Iraq, Iran and the Levant, South Asia, Egypt and later China. These experiments would ultimately lead to humankind taking to agriculture almost everywhere. Not all these experiments were successful, not all those successful were sustainable. And many experiments that did not succeed or sustain for long may not be traceable in the archaeological records today. But when agriculture finally took off for certain in the Fertile Crescent and in India, Egypt and China over a transitionary period of 4,000 or 5,000 years between 9700 BCE and 5000 BCE, the human population started exploding in a manner never seen before, leading to massive migrations that changed world demography in Europe, Central Asia, South Asia, China and East Asia. 
miracle in Medgar, the hotspot of the earliest experiments in agriculture in South Asia is a village today called Medgar, located at the foot of the Bolan Pass in Balochistan in modern-day Pakistan. The site was inhabited for a period of about 4,400 years between roughly 7,000 BCE and 2,600 BCE. At its peak, it covered an area of about 200 hectares, which would make it one of the largest habitations of the period between the Indus and the Mediterranean. Mergud was discovered as a historical site in 1976 by a French archaeological mission working in collaboration with Pakistan's Department of Archaeology, and it dramatically changed our understanding of how agriculture began and spread in South Asia. Mergud laid the foundations for the Harappan civilization that was to follow. The excavated mound at Mergud had cultural deposits, material remains that had been used, made a change by humans that were 9 meters thick, covering the period from around 7000 BCE. When people live in a settlement for hundreds or thousands of years, the accumulated refuse and debris, especially bricks, cause the ground level to rise, forming mounds. The thickness of the deposits, therefore, can be a rough indication of how long a settlement was occupied, in comparison with other sites in similar circumstances. At the bottommost layer the researchers found small, rectangular, multi-room mud brick houses, some of which may have been used for storage. Sickles made of microliths attached originally to wooden handles that may have been used for harvesting grains, remains of barley and wheat grains in the soil and in the mud bricks, remains of meals, suggesting consumption of hunted animals such as gazelle, nilgai, blackbuck, wild pig and water buffalo, and evidence of domestication of the local hump cattle, zebu, boss indicus and perhaps goat as well. Jean-Francois Jarrage, the leader of the French team, described their finds at the earliest levels, which were as ceramic or without pottery, thus, all the excavated buildings are multi-room structures. Four different plan types have been recorded, two-room, four-room, six-room and ten-room buildings. Most of the walls of these buildings are composed of two rows of hand-molded mud bricks longitudinally arranged. These long and narrow bricks measured 62 x 12 by 8 cm with generally on their upper faces a herringbone pattern of impressions of the brickmaker's thumbs to provide a king for the mud-mortar in which they were set. One mud-mortar refers to a paste used to bind together building blocks, in this case, bricks. The brickmaker's thumb impressions create a non-smooth surface which helps the mortar to hold the building blocks together. Elsewhere Jarraj describes the bricks as being cigar-shaped. Jarraj's team noted that the six-room buildings revealed no fireplace or significant remains of domestic activities, unlike what was found in some of the other buildings, thus suggesting that these bigger structures were probably used as granaries or storage facilities. The walls of the clay houses were plastered inside and outside with a 2 cm thick clay mortar. There are evidences that the coatings of the external walls of several houses were colored in red or even adorned with paintings. A portion of a collapsed wall from level 1, the earliest level of excavation, dated to around 7000 BCE, was colored in plain red ochre. In the upper levels, similar traces of red paint were found on several walls. Quite sizable fragmentary impressions of external plaster fallen on the ground show red V-shaped motifs and in one case, a complex geometrical pattern of red lines and red and black dots. Some floors made of packed and rammed earth were also covered with red ochre. Some roofing fragments have also been discovered in the building debris. They consisted of fragments of chaff-tempered mud with several impressions of fibrous stems of reeds. Many rooms in the smaller buildings had traces of fireplaces, and in the open spaces between houses many circular fire pits were discovered, their diameters ranging between 40 and 60 cm and with a maximum depth of about 45 cm. Interestingly, most fire pits had heavily burnt, cracked pebbles and one had oval-shaped clay balls. Their use wasn't difficult to decipher, since in Balochistan bread is cooked on heated stones even today. The plant assemblage of Mergud, or the selection of plants that were being used by the residents, as revealed by the remains excavated from the site, was dominated by a particular variety of barley. The naked six-row barley, naked means hull less, and six-row refers to the number of spikelets with grains on them. It accounted for more than 90% of the recorded seeds and imprints on the site. But were the residents of Mergud just gathering wild barley or were they actively cultivating it? There's a way to find out.
All domesticated plants and animals differ from their wild ancestors in fairly predictable ways because of the selection pressures that domestication puts on their evolution over time. Many domesticated animals, for example, become smaller in size, show less aggression, develop smaller brains and lose the more extravagant horns. Also, sexual dimorphism, where the male and female sizes differ significantly, slowly disappears. It is easy to see why. On the one hand, humans select their animals for their ease of taming and lack of aggression, which reflects in such changes as a smaller head or horns, less visibly dangerous teeth and smaller brains. On the other hand, many of the usual selection pressures on animals are taken away because they no longer have to compete with other animals of their species either for food or for mates. Domestication causes many changes in plants too. For example, their seeds no longer shatter when ripe, and they germinate far more easily and are larger. It is easy to see why this happens too. When humans harvest their crop, the seeds that are already shattered are lost and dispersed in the soil while those that are still on the stem are collected. Some of them are used for consumption, and the rest kept for sowing in the next period. This acts as a strong selection pressure for seeds that do not shatter immediately on ripening. To look at it from the other side, since plants that are domesticated no longer have to worry about spreading their seeds, a job that is now taken over by humans, the usual selection pressures that make seed pods self-shatter cease to operate. Similar pressures explain how domesticated seeds of plants are often larger and why they germinate more easily too. Because of these differences, scientists while looking at ancient fossils of animals or plants can figure out whether these were domesticated or wild. This is important because even if a settlement has, say, sickles and evidence of granaries and of consumption of cereals, this need not mean that the people were agriculturists, they could merely have been hunter-gatherers harvesting wild crops rather than cultivating them. The presence of domesticated animals and plants, on the other hand, is a clear indication that the people are indeed agriculturists, not hunter-gatherers. In the case of the barley found at the earliest levels at Mergud, the anthropologist and agricultural scientist Lorenzo Constantini found it to be cultivated but not perhaps fully domesticated, meaning that the process of domestication was still underway. What about the animals? Were they domesticated too? The residents of Mergud were avid hunters, but there is also evidence of animal domestication, at first limited to goat. A few graves at the earliest excavation levels for young women had up to five complete skeletons of kids or young goats placed around their legs in a semicircle. The presence of bones of relatively small subadult and adult animals in the trash deposits at the earliest excavation levels also suggests the domesticated status of goats, according to the archaeologist and zoologist R. H. Meadow, who was part of excavations at both Mergud and Harappa. This is because wild hunters usually target bigger animals in a herd to maximize their gains, herders are likely to cull younger males. So the size of the animals consumed as evidenced by the trash deposits as a signal of the domestication process as well. Meadow also showed that during period 1 at Mergud, that is, from around 7000 BCE to around 6000 BCE, sheep and cattle came to increasingly dominate the animal remains of the settlement, as opposed to the remains of hunted animals such as Nilgai and gazelles, another indication of domestication. By the end of period 1, cattle bones accounted for over half of the animal remains, with the indigenous hump cattle zebu becoming the dominant presence. According to Meadow, the animals in Mergud grew smaller in body size over time, as is expected when the domestication process is on. In the middle of all this domesticating plants and animals, building houses, hunting, the residents of Mergud also found time to indulge their creative side. Archaeologists found remains of workshops of bead makers, who were using calcite or steatite, both the types of mineral rocks, as raw material. Grave goods, or things that are buried along with the dead, gave an even clearer picture of craft production in Mergud. These included ornaments made of seashells, lapis lazuli, turquoise, black steatite and many other such stones. Note that since Mergud is nowhere near the sea, the seashells indicate long-range trading or exchange networks that probably reached up to the Makran coast of today's Pakistan. The ornaments were created with an unexpected level of sophistication, says Jaraj. He describes a particularly striking burial thus, exceptional grave deposits are dentalium, a kind of long, thin shell, headbands found on the heads of several females. 
dot dot in burial 274 the headband was made of woven rows of small dentilium segments and closed by two straps used as a clasp each of them was ornamented with four perforated natural shells around the neck was a thin necklace made of shell beads and at the waist a belt like ornament was made up of cylindrical shell beads and one flattened polyhedral shell head Hanging on the belt, an interlacing of numerous threaded dentilium beads was found in front of the pelvis of the individual. But there was an even more impressive discovery. At an excavation level dated to around 6000 BCE, the archaeologists found imprints of cotton thread inside the holes of copper beads discovered in one of the two graves there, the first evidence of the use of cotton anywhere in the world, and also the first evidence of the use of copper in the subcontinent. The quantity and quality of beads and other ornaments kept rising over time, with some of the raw materials coming from faraway areas. The techniques were also improving, with the bead makers, for example, figuring out how to transform black steatite into white steatite by a heating process. If crafts were flourishing, so it seems were other occupations, some graveyards show the earliest evidence of dentistry in archaeological records anywhere. 11 drilled molar crowns from 9 individuals, 4 females, 2 males and 3 unidentified have been recorded. One individual has 3 drilled teeth, another has the same tooth drilled twice. We do not know whether there were full-time, dentists, or part-time dabblers in a new profession, but one guesses the new Neolithic eating habits were not great news for the teeth of the Mergadians. Neolithic is associated with the beginnings of farming and the domestication of animals and plants in general. In archaeological records, this period is often represented by polished stone tools and implements such as grinding stones and, sometimes, pottery. The Neolithic Age is preceded by the Paleolithic Age and succeeded by the Chalcolithic or Copper Age. The ceramic period in Mergad began only around 6000 BCE, more than a thousand years after the start of the settlement. Until then, the people of Mergad made do with baskets coated with bitumen, a naturally occurring sticky, black hydrocarbon mixture, and stone vessels. When the first few samples of pottery appear in Mergad around 6000 BCE, they are pretty crudely made pots herds. But crucially these pots were not wheel made, but constructed by assembling pieces of clay, perhaps using bitumen to hold them together. This early pottery technique is called sequential slab construction and we will come across this again later. During the ceramic period, the number and size of storage structures increased dramatically, indicating a rising population. There is increasing use of fine, lustrous red pottery, but grave goods are no longer a common practice, except for a few beads seen now and then. By 5300 BCE, the Chalcolithic period had begun, and the progress in material culture continued unabated, with innovation upon innovation, wheel-turned pottery, cotton cultivation, terracotta figurines, all leading up to the early Harappan phase of the civilization by 3000 BCE. Early Harappan only refers to the time period. Mergad is not considered a part of the Harappan civilization. The Mergad site was abandoned sometime between 2600 BCE and 2000 BCE in favor of the larger, fortified city of Noshiro about 5 miles away. Mergad is likely to have spawned a number of Chalcolithic cultures in the region that were precursors to the full-fledged Harappan civilization, with names such Hakra, Kord Diji, Amri, Nal and Ahar. So within a period of about 5,000 years, Mergad had grown from a small settlement beginning its experiments with farming to perhaps an important center too for the rapid expansion of a new way of living across the northwestern region of the subcontinent that would ultimately lead to the making of the largest civilization of its time in the valleys of the Indus and the Ghaggar Hakra River. But who were the people of Mergad and where did they come from? West Asian parallels If you look back at the beginnings of Mergad, you will notice that there is a gap between the hunter-gatherer lifestyle that we saw in the previous chapter and the lifestyle reflected in the excavation layers. It is as if there's a missing link. The Mergadians start building the first mud brick houses in the subcontinent and the first granaries as soon as they set up base. And there is almost instant startup of farming and pastoralism, without the long lead times one observes in West Asia, where the early experiments in agriculture began a few millennia earlier, in fits and starts, often reaching dead ends and going no further, as the changing climate sometimes spurred on new experimentation and sometimes killed them off. 
The story of agricultural beginnings in West Asia is not a linear or a neat one, but it is fascinating, because this is the most dramatic episode in the history of modern humans until then, in a period of roughly 300,000 years. It is possible that other regions where agriculture developed early have equally fascinating backgrounds, but nowhere has this modern human breakout moment been recorded, researched and analyzed as closely and graphically as in West Asia. We must follow that process of evolution to understand the nature of the agricultural transition, its world-altering consequences and, most importantly, its relationship with Mergul. So here we go. The archaeologists A. Nigel Goring Morris and Anna Belfa Cohen of the University of Jerusalem, who have written extensively on the emergence of the farming culture in the Levant, say, it is important to stress that developments appear to have been directional only in retrospect. The processes that took place were multifaceted, with various options available at the time. Some of the choices, ultimately, were signi can't to future developments, but others were sideshows or culls de sac in the evolutionary sense. Accordingly, within the archaeological record, we may stumble on evidence for both categories. 3. The authors then lay out the case for why the early processes of Neolithization or farming transition should be traced all the way back to around 20,000 years ago, during the last glacial period 29,000 to 14,000 years ago. This corresponds to a chronological span of some 15,000 years until the end of the Neolithic, that is, the equivalent of some 500 to 600 generations, they say. The story begins with hunter-gatherers in the Levant struggling with the stresses of the glacial period when many areas turned uninhabitable and resources became scarce. Population density in the habitable regions would have increased as existing populations crowded into these refuges as they retreated from elsewhere. Populations at this time would usually mean bands of 20 to 30 individuals, who may have had a larger social network of 250 to 500 individuals, which is necessary for a minimal sustainable mating network. Increasing scarcity of habitable environments could have given the first impetus for a greater degree of sedentism or being less mobile than earlier and the rising population density could have triggered the search for better ways of gathering and processing food. As the climate started getting better slowly around 14,000 years ago, some of these experiments would have succeeded, while others failed. And those groups who had success with their experiments might have taken to a greater degree of sedentism, while others remained as mobile as earlier. The Natchfian culture that existed for about 3,000 years from 12,500 BCE to 9,500 BCE is often seen as the embodiment of this new dual style of living, with some sections of the population being sedentary and others remaining mobile to varying degrees. Natchfian comes from Wadi and Native, or the Valley of Native, in Palestine, the area where the archaeologist Dorothy Garrett discovered cultural deposits of what she would in 1928 call the Natchfian culture. According to Goring Morris and Belfa Cohen, while some groups were more or less sedentary in favorable ecological settings, e.g., on the shores of lakes or marshes, others likely practiced seasonal residential mobility, and still others on the margins were even more mobile. The Natchfions had a large variety of groundstone utensils, especially mortars and pounding stones, suggesting that they were improving and intensifying their food processing techniques. They also had stone sickles, or stone blades inserted in bone handles, which suggests that they were harvesting something, perhaps reeds. It is unlikely that they were harvesting wild cereals because that would have led to sickle gloss, the sheen on a blade that is a byproduct of cutting the stalks of cereals as they are rich in silica, which few, if any, of these implements had. There is also no evidence that they were doing any cultivation, though they had intensified the collection of plants just as they had intensified food processing. There is reason to think that the sizes of at least some Natchfian populations were increasing, and a sense of territoriality was becoming prevalent. For example, the Natchfian sites began to have specially designated areas for burials. There were also exchange networks that were trading both utilitarian things such as stone utensils and exotic items such as mollusks, greenstone and other minerals. New cottage industries were emerging, with archaeological evidence suggesting an increased abundance of bone tool assemblages for basketry and matting. There is evidence for new fire technologies as well, such as lime plaster production and the making of fire clay and ochre. 
The Natchvian culture, however, didn't survive long perhaps because of the deleterious effects of the dry, arid younger dryers phase 12,900 to 11,700 years ago. The early Natchvian had large, well-built structures that were occupied by units bigger than nuclear families, but later on these units became smaller. There was also increasing mobility, while some areas were simply abandoned. The changing nature of Natchvian culture was probably a result of the volatile nature of the climate and their response to it. It wasn't just the Natchvians in the Levant who were experimenting with new things. Excavations at the site of Abu Huraira, near Muribit on the middle Euphrates, turned up evidence that around 11,000 BCE the residents here were harvesting wild wheat and rye. Rye, in fact, started showing signs of being domesticated as early as 10,700 BCE. There is still some debate about this among scientists and the issue is not settled, but if this finding is correct, it would be the earliest instance of domestication of any cereal. This didn't lead anywhere though, rye never became an important part of the agricultural package of West Asia, and Abu Huraira itself was almost abandoned after the younger dryers. The stresses of the younger dryers were soon put behind when the world started warming up again very rapidly around 11,700 years ago, raising the global temperature by as much as 7 degrees Celsius on average. And very quickly, archaeologists say, we start seeing evidence of domesticated varieties of cereals or at least, management of wild varieties of plants and animals in the larger fertile crescent region. By management, they mean people taking care of wild plants and animals in a variety of ways with an intent to use them for later consumption. The different ways of management could range from deliberate cultivation to careful tending and harvesting of wild crops. The earliest evidence for domesticated wheat varieties Emma and Yinkon come from sites in the upper Euphrates Valley in the Levant, dated to about 8580-200 BCE. Securely dated domesticated barley is seen around 8000 BCE, by which time its presence is recorded throughout the Fertile Crescent and the Anatolian Plateau. The first evidence for domestication of goats, on the other hand, comes from the settlement of Gunj Dere in the central Zagros mountain region and is dated to 7900 BCE. Archaeologists found in this natural habitat of goats the typical herding signature, early slaughter of young male goats and delayed slaughter of females. This is a strong signal of herding because herders usually cull the young males while keeping the females for breeding and perhaps milk consumption as well. A similar pattern was also observed in the settlement of Ali Kosh in southwestern Iran, which was first occupied around 7500 BCE. Ali Kosh is outside the natural habitat of goats, which suggests that the pastoralists were already taking their herds to newer regions by then. Both Gunj Dare and Ali Kosh show evidence of full-fledged herding. But there are earlier signals of game management that may not have gone as far as herding point for so one way or another. In the period between 8000 BCE and 7000 BCE, the evidence of goat domestication became widespread in the whole region, with goats replacing the hunted gazelle as the dominant presence in the animal remains of the settlements. The last regions to see this happen were the Levant 7200 BCE and the eastern arm of the Fertile Crescent 7000 BCE. According to the archaeologist Melinda A. Zedder, the evidence for cattle or storage domestication in the region is still sketchy. In a 2011 paper, she wrote that although cattle remains from sites in the upper and middle Euphrates Valley dated between 9000 BCE and 8000 BCE fall within the size range of wild aurochs and Eurasian ox at several sites there is evidence for a reduction in sexual dimorphism. Five cattle from other contemporary sites in the same region were still highly sexually dimorphic and could thus be seen as representing wild, hunted cattle. According to Zedda, domestic cattle slowly spread out of this heartland of initial domestication, getting to the southernmost reaches of the Levant only around 750-7000 BCE at the earliest and the southern Zagros around 6500 BCE. So the broad picture we see is that between 9500 BCE and 6500 BCE, that is, a 3000 year period immediately following the end of the Younger Dryas and the beginning of Holocene, both plant and animal domestication had spread across most of the Fertile Crescent, after progressing in fits and starts during the last glacial period, with different regions contributing in different ways at different times and probably with multiple instances of domestication for the same species. 
As we saw, even as the transition was on, people were taking their plants and animals, perhaps still in the process of being domesticated and perhaps not even that, and migrating to newer places. Many places in the fertile crescent itself saw plants or animals being imported, an example being boats in the southern Levant. But the most interesting case of the introduction of plants and animals to a new area is Cyprus, where migrating humans brought with them both plants and animals, around 8500 BCE. Where the migrants came from is not clear, but there are indications that they could have been from North Levantine littoral, which may have seen significant increases in population during that period. Archaeological evidence on the ground shows that the incoming migrants brought with them domesticated barley and wheat, both in corn and emma and wild but managed cattle and goats. Zeder writes, this means that at the same time that the earliest morphologically domesticated in corn and emma is found in the upper Euphrates valley and even earlier than there is solid evidence for morphologically altered domestic barley and when we see three. RST indications of animal management in the mainland fertile crescent, people were loading these managed plants and animals into boats and carrying them, along with the knowledge of how to successfully care for them, to an island 160 kilometers off the Levantine coast. None of these animals occurred naturally in Cyprus, so the confidence of the migrants in importing them and their success in exploiting them showed that human control over these budding domesticates was more established than is apparent on the mainland, says Zeda. Proof to Mergut this is the background to be kept in mind while we go back to the question that started this discussion, where did the people of Mergut come from? There are also a few other things to consider. For example, remember that the Kachi plain where Mergut is located is a semi-arid region even in today's wetter and warmer Holocene climate, so it is likely to have been desert-like until about 9700 BCE because of the glacial age and then the younger dryers. So whoever left behind the evidence of their settlement in Mergut starting from around 7000 BCE couldn't have been thriving there for longer than a few thousand years before that. The region would have become significantly populated only when the climate changed, the deserts started turning green, the herbivores moved in looking for food and the carnivores followed them, looking for prey. And the humans, of course, followed all of them. So where could they have come from? There are two broad possibilities. They were either the first Indians, expanding their range westwards from their glacial age refuges in central, southern or eastern India, or they were the original inhabitants of Iran, expanding eastwards from their own refuges in the region. Or perhaps both happened simultaneously, or in quick succession, resulting in a mixed population. One factor that is of importance while considering this issue is that Mergud is on the edge of a West Asian climatic zone that is dominated by winter rains and winter crops. To its east is the Indian climatic zone, dominated by monsoons and summer rains and summer crops. For the first Indians, therefore, traveling northwest from central or southern India would have meant moving into unfamiliar territory. For the Iranians moving into the same region, though, it would have been just a range expansion, with no discernible change in climate or vegetation patterns. This is not to say, of course, that Mergut couldn't have been populated by those moving in from the east, because if climatic zones had been an impenetrable factor for them, modern humans would never have got out of Africa in the first place. So we need to look at other pieces of evidence to see how Mergut could have come into being. But before we do that, let us remember that neither India nor Iran existed then and, therefore, these terms would be meaningless to the people moving into these regions. These terms are being used here merely as approximate geographical assignations to understand this period. One obvious set of evidence to look for is similarities between what we find in Mergud and what we find towards its east and its west. Towards the east the earliest evidence for agriculture is from Gujarat and eastern Rajasthan from around 3700 BCE. In southern and eastern India from around 3000 BCE, in Malwa, Madhya Pradesh, from around 2000 BCE, in the Vindhya region from around 1700 BCE, and in the Kashmir and Swat valleys from around 1500 BCE. Northeastern India is too inadequately excavated to come to a conclusion on the beginnings of agriculture there. All of these posts date Mergud by thousands of years and, therefore, do not provide a platform for comparison. 
The only region that could provide such a platform is the Middle Ganga region, where at Lahuradeva in the Sant Kabir Nagar district of Uttar Pradesh in the Upper Ganga plain there is indeed evidence for rice harvesting, sedentary settlement and ceramics dating back to about 7000 BCE. The chronology of the transition from harvesting wild rice to cultivating domesticated rice is not yet certain, but there is no doubt that Lahuradeva indicates experiments in agriculture were happening at several places in South Asia around the same time and that Mergad was not alone. The only thing inhibiting its connection or comparison with Mergad is the fact that the harvested plant crop in Lahuradeva is rice, and not wheat or barley as in Mergad, which later on became the mainstay of the Harappan civilization. Why didn't the Lahuradeva experiments lead to a rice cultivation based civilization of its own in the middle Ganga region at this time? It is quite possible that for ecological or other reasons Lahuradeva could not develop a full agricultural package, with multiple crops and many domesticated animals as in Mergad or West Asia. It could also be that the variety of rice that was grown at Lahuradeva was yet to reach its full productivity potential, which may have happened after hybridization with Japonica rice which arrived from East Asia much later see chapter 3, p. 157. What about similarities with West Asia? Jaraj has this to say, in spite of some obvious differences. For instance the progressive predominance of the breeding of Zebu, Boss Indicus, the full setting of the farming economy at Mergad displays evident similarities with what had been noticed in the case of the early Neolithic settlements in the hilly regions forming the eastern border of Mesopotamia. For example, at the Ganjdare and Ali Kosh sites in the Deluran region of Iran at the foothills of the Zagros Mountains, dated to around 7900 BCE, archaeologists have found the same kind of quadrangular houses built with narrow bricks about 60 cm long with finger marks for keying the mortar as was seen in Mergad. Circular fire pits filled with burnt pebbles that were found at Mergad were also common at all these early settlements, and so were the traces of red paint found on the walls of the structures in Mergad. Polished stone axes made in black diorite are found only in the upper levels of period 1 in Mergad and, similarly, in Ali Kosh, they are found only in the later phases, along with stone vessels. Only a few graves have been exposed at Ali Kosh, but they show skeletons placed in positions similar to those at Mergad. Other similarities include ornaments made of seashells and semi-precious stones such as turquoise, a few beads in copper, baskets coated with bitumen and oblong-shaped cakes of red ochre. The most striking parallels, however, could be the sequential slab construction method by which the earliest ceramics were made in Mergad and at the foothills of the Zagros Mountains and the building of big, multicellular granaries. Jarich says the similarities between the sites on the eastern border of Mesopotamia, such as Ganjdare and Ali Kosh, and on the western margins of the Indus Valley, such as Mergad, are significant. He uses the phrase, a sort of cultural continuum, to describe the relationship between the two regions in terms of the geographical context and the evolution of the sites over time. It is, therefore, difficult to escape the conclusion that there were very close connections between the Mergad Neolithic and West Asian Neolithic, but that should not take away from the fact that Mergad had its own strong and striking characteristics, quite separate from those of West Asia. The domestication of the zebu cattle and possibly an indigenous goat variety, the early discovery and use of cotton, the dentistry and the profusion of craft activities and the quality of their work, all stand out and perhaps suggest, an earlier, local background, as Jaraj puts it, that is yet to be fully understood. There is also little doubt that the water buffalo, as important a part of South Asia's food economy as the zebu cattle, was also domesticated in India, though whether this was done at Mergad or somewhere in Gujarat is open to debate. Similarities between two regions can occur either because of migrations or because of cultural diffusion, mediated perhaps by nomadic groups. So which one could it have been in Mergad? That Mergad was a little bit behind the developments in West Asia in chronological terms shows that, on current evidence, the flow of ideas in the early stages is more likely to have been from the west to the east, rather than from the east to the west. But that still does not answer the question whether the Neolithic transformation of Mergad was accompanied by migrations of people. And there is only one way to settle this issue, DNA evidence, especially ancient DNA. 
The story that DNA tells there are three ways in which you can use DNA evidence to probe affinities between different populations and to trace migrations, analysis of uniparental DNA, Y chromosome or mtDNA of present day populations, whole genome sequencing of present day populations and DNA analysis of ancient human remains. Let us go through them one by one and see what they have to say about whether there was a migration of Iranian agriculturists into South Asia. Uniparental DNA analysis looks at the haplogroups present in a population and analyzes their family tree or phylogeny, and also maps their geographical distribution. As mentioned earlier, haplogroups identify a single line of descent either through the paternal line, from father to son to his son and so on, Y chromosome, or through the maternal line, from mother to daughter to her daughter and so on, mtDNA. Since mutations happen at a fairly predictable rate, these lines of descent branch out over time, forming clear family trees with the mutations being the nodes from where new branches sprout. These branches and sub-branches are called macro haplogroups, haplogroups or subhaplogroups or clades and they are named separately for Y chromosome and mtDNA lineages. Geneticists have worked out Y chromosome and mtDNA family trees that cover most of the modern human population based on current knowledge, and these are updated and expanded as new data comes in. Therefore, a geneticist can analyze the aniparental DNA of a person and decipher the macro haplogroup, haplogroup and clade or subclade that he or she belongs to and, therefore, the family tree that he or she is part of. This is what happens, for example, when you hand over your DNA to a company that specializes in decoding your ancestry. If two persons belong to the same mtDNA haplogroup, it means that they share a common female ancestor, and if two people belong to the same Y chromosome haplogroup, it means that they share a common male ancestor, going back to the time when that haplogroup originated. And it's not just the family tree that can be worked out. Based on available data, we can also work out the phylogeography of different haplogroups, which tells you not just to which branch of what family tree you belong, but also how that particular branch is distributed around the world today geographically and also how old a particular haplogroup or its subclade is. For example, we know that mtDNA haplogroup M2 is the most ancient haplogroup in the Indian subcontinent, that it arose around 60,200 years ago and that it is rarely found outside of South Asia. Die first method, Y chromosome and mtDNA The first method of getting an approximate idea of migrations is by accessing data on the distribution of various mtDNA and Y chromosome haplogroups within a population and analyzing their phylogeography. There are two pieces of data that could give clues about where a particular haplogroup or its subclade originated and how it spread, the relative frequency or popularity of the haplogroup in the different regions in which it is present and the variance within the haplogroup. Variance measures the diversity of subclades that a haplogroup has, and this is usually a function of the age of the haplogroup in a particular region and the population size. The higher the frequency and variance of a haplogroup in a particular region, the higher the likelihood that this region was a center from which the haplogroup spread. Many such studies have been done in India, giving us some idea of the extent to which migrations may have shaped our demography. For example, as mentioned earlier, we now know that 70 to 90 percent of mtDNA haplogroups in Indian populations can trace their origin to the first Indians who arrived in India some 65,000 years ago. This means that only about 10 to 30 percent of mtDNA lineages in the country are the result of later migrations. But the picture is radically different on the Y chromosome side. As mentioned earlier, only 10 to 40 percent of the Y chromosome haplogroups in various Indian populations are descendant lineages of the first Indians. That means over 60 percent of Y chromosome haplogroups in the country are the result of later migrations. There is a reason for this difference, which we will get into in chapter 4. We also know which haplogroups are likely to owe their origin to the first Indians and which ones are likely to be the result of later migrations. The 2017 paper by Marina Silver and others identified mtDNA haplogroups K2A5, U1A3A, H13A2 or an R0A2 as Neolithic period migrations from West Asia, meaning they could be the mtDNA groups that came to India as part of farming-related migrations. The same study mentioned Y chromosome haplogroups J2, L1A and L1C as the ones most likely to be associated with the spread of agriculture from West Asia. 
But wait, as we discussed in chapter 1, pp. 23 to 24, uniparental chromosomes, mtDNA, and Y chromosome capture only a small part of the entire genome of individuals. So can we do whole genome analysis and see if those results to support the results of the uniparental DNA analysis? Yes, we can, as we shall find out now. Dissecond method, whole genome data There are two studies, one published in 2009 and the other in 2013, that did extensive sampling of present-day Indian population groups and used whole genome sequencing to reconstruct India's population history. Both papers had David Reich of the Harvard Medical School, K. Thangaraj and Lalji Singh of CCMB and Nick Patterson of the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT as co-authors, among others. The first paper was titled, Reconstructing Indian Population History, and the second was titled, Genetic Evidence for Recent Population Mixture in India. Both studies emphasized one fact, everyone in India today is a mix, in different proportions, of ancestry related to at least two groups, the first Indians and West Eurasians. Six, the term West Eurasian includes West Asians such as people of the Fertile Crescent and Iran, as well as those from Central Asia, the Caucasus and Europe. The studies showed that all population groups in India today have some amount of West Eurasian ancestry, varying from 20% to 80%, depending on the group. Whole genome sequence data of present-day populations give us a general picture of affinities between different groups, though not a granular picture of how that affinity came about or who moved from where to where. But there were some twists in the story before this research conclusion was put to paper and it is worth following these twists to understand the political context of the discussions about migrations. The suggestion that modern Indians carry a significant amount of West Eurasian related ancestry was unpalatable to many, probably because it seemed to support the long-standing theory that it was a migration of steppe pastoralists from Central Asia sometime within the last 4000 years that brought Indo-European languages, including an early version of Sanskrit, and related cultural practices and concepts to India. These Indo-European language speakers called themselves Aryans, and for many in the right wing the idea that they came to India from elsewhere is unacceptable because they believe it would dethrone Sanskrit and the Vedas as the singular and fundamental source of Indian culture, as it would mean that the mighty Harappan civilization that has left an indelible impression on Indian history and culture would have preceded their arrival. Reich describes the reaction to the findings of the research in his 2018 book, Who We Are and How We Got Here. The tensest 24 hours of my scientific career came in October 2008 when my collaborator Nick Patterson and I traveled to Hyderabad to discuss these initial results with Singh and Thangaraj. Our meeting on October 28 was challenging. Singh and Thangaraj seemed to be threatening to nix the whole project. Prior to the meeting, we had shown them a summary of our findings, which were that Indians today descend from a mixture of two highly divergent ancestral populations, one being West Eurasians the other being the first Indians. Singh and Thangaraj objected to this formulation because, they argued, it implied that West Eurasian people migrated en masse into India. They correctly pointed out that our data provided no direct evidence for this conclusion. They even reasoned that there could have been a migration in the other direction, of Indians to the Near East Seven and Europe. The cultural resonances of our findings gradually became clear to us. So we groped toward a formulation that would be scientifically accurate as well as sensitive to these concerns. The next day, the full group reconvened in Singh's office. We sat together and came up with new names for ancient Indian groups. We wrote that the people of India today are the outcome of mixtures between two highly differentiated populations, ancestral North Indians Ani and ancestral South Indians Asi, who before their mixture were as different from each other as Europeans and East Asians are today. The Ani are related to Europeans, Central Asians, Near Easterners and people of the Caucasus, but we made no claim about the location of their homeland or any migration. According to the study, the Asi were the descendants of the first Indians. In essence, instead of stating that today's Indians are descendants of both the first Indians and West Eurasian related populations as the research suggested, the published paper created two new theoretically constructed population groups and said that today's Indians are the result of a mixture of two highly differentiated groups, Ani and Asi, with the Ani being closely related to West Eurasians. 
This was a scientifically defendable framework to understand the population structure of South Asia and to avoid a political controversy, but the cost of the compromise was that it made it easier to misinterpret the study. For instance, it left room for uninformed and false commentary in the news media that the Ani was a homogeneous and very ancient population group of India, like the Asi, which had settled here tens of thousands of years ago. This, despite the study itself stating clearly that the Ani could be a mixture of populations resulting from multiple migrations and may not be a homogeneous group, thus leaving open the possibility that some migrations could be as recent as within the last 4,000 years. Even with this formulation, the paper improved our understanding of Indian population formation, because it provided genetic evidence for a mixing of the descendants of the first Indians and other population groups who were closely related to the current day populations of West Asia, Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia. But this still left a problem, as those ideologically not ready to accept the idea of migrations into India could still assert that the direction of migration was from India to the rest of the world and this is what accounts for the close relationship between some population groups of India and those of West Asia, Europe, the Caucasus and Central Asia. Whole genome data can prove affinity between population groups, but it cannot necessarily prove the direction of migration. As for any parental data, large-scale population movements or natural calamities and epidemics that may have happened in the past could make it difficult to interpret the current day distribution, frequency and variance data of haplogrips. So in addition to the two methods we have already discussed, uniparental DNA analysis based on present-day mtDNA and Y-chromosome lineages and whole genome sequencing of present-day populations, we need to look for a third method to settle the argument about the direction of migration, and there is, in fact, such a method, DNA analysis of ancient human remains. And to this we turn now. Thai third method, ancient DNA Ancient DNA can settle questions about the direction of movement of peoples for the simple reason that with samples of DNA taken from ancient human skeletons at different time periods in a particular location, we can see how populations move on the ground in the past. For example, if we see that ancient DNA from location X before 2000 BCE shows no evidence whatsoever for, say, any Central Asian or steppe lineage, and then from 1000 BCE onward we start seeing lots of evidence for that lineage, then we can clearly conclude that there was an influx of people with steppe lineage into location X sometime between 2000 BCE and 1000 BCE. The science of ancient DNA took off only in the past 5 years or so. And since then, it has been rewriting history as we know it in continent after continent. The beauty of this process is that as more and more ancient DNA gets analyzed across regions and continents, it is as if the pieces of a global historical puzzle are rapidly falling in place. The more the global migration picture gets filled, the more difficult it becomes to overturn the scientific consensus on how each region got populated. The new ancient DNA-based study that would settle long-standing questions about Indian prehistory was titled, The Genomic Formation of South and Central Asia, and was posted on the preprint server for biology, Biotif, in March 2018. It was co-authored by 92 scientists from around the world and was co-authored and co-directed by David Wright, who runs a lab that currently has no equal in its ability to sequence and analyze DNA at scale and speed. Notably, among the 92 co-authors were scientists from different disciplines who are stars in their own fields, such as James Mallory, archaeologist and author of the classic book In Search of Indo-Europeans, Language, Archaeology and Myth, and David Anthony, anthropologist and author of the groundbreaking book One He Horse, The Wheel and Language.